Welcome to Legacy Conversations, a channel where we preserve military memories and history. So I want to quickly clarify something so there is no confusion. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that there was a team on the western side of the river, uh, four of them. I think there were four. Um, and the course for way, under the leadership of course for way. And they had been walking in. And I think the area that they were in was not suitable for A, for vehicles. And two, there was a lot more movement by enemy uh, in the area. And vehicles would certainly be uh, more noticeable and be picked up quicker. The second part of it is this is the first time we'd actually utilized um, the modified Unimog Sabres, uh, to my knowledge. Um, I know Sabres had been used, but not in this particular role, but where the various armaments have been placed on them, but they hadn't been kitted out and, and prepared as much as uh, we had had for this, which was the forerunner of a lot more that were developed at a later stage. And the photographs uh, that I've supplied will clearly identify this. So... As I mentioned, we were due to pick up some of the small team operators. Um, they were gathering information in the area. We weren't told whom, or let me say, in the radio communication, which I was not part of, in talking back to our operational base uh, under the command of Hannes Fenter. And in this instance, um, Rolf Moore was our signaler as well. Um, so it was nice working with the same team that we always worked before. Familiarity makes it so much easier because we were using Morse code when we talked to these guys um, and what we would do for people who are signalers with Morse code is difficult enough. And part of the reason we use Morse code is that if you are on a two-way radio and you press down the pressel switch to communicate, you send out a signal. And if enemy is trying to look for you, they can pick up that signal. And what they do, they use directional finding equipment to say oh that signal is coming from such a location if you've got three or four places and they can do that they can locate the area that you are in so it makes it a lot easier for the enemy to triangulate you the term that is utilized to figure out where you are if you're using morse code every time you press the key that's the only time that the signal goes out and it's very difficult to pick it up and some of us were better uh, operators than others i am i was the morse i was the radio operator as well at times, um, so we used to send a message. And the message wasn't just open. It wasn't, hi, how are you doing, Tony? What's the weather like today as in normal Morse code? We had a encoding and a decoding process. So we had a book based on a certain number. It wasn't a date. We would know the number sequence. And if we didn't, the number would be sent out. But it was sent out in such a way that only we would know what the number was for that day, for the code, to encode and decode. So if you wanted to send a message out to somebody, you obviously got to break down every letter and use the alternative in your coding system once that is done. So to encode a message would take you sometimes 20 minutes to do, and that's being uninterrupted. Um, and that's most probably three to 400 characters, maybe a bit more. If something more happens, it could be longer. And then it gets sent off to uh, HQ. They get it and they decode it and they know exactly what it is. It's also easier for them to talk to us so they could talk via radio, but we had to answer in Morse code. Um, so sometimes you get a bit frustrated doing this. Uh, and it's not a tabletop Morse code uh, key that you operate. It's strapped to your thigh. The SAS were very adept at doing this, like we were. And we had some guys who just had that ability. It's like knitting. Some guys are really good with it. And other guys are really crap. Other guys are good at cooking and other guys can't do it. It's the same type of thing. So we, from our messaging we got, we had to pick up some of the small team operators. We told them where we were and um, they said they were going to be joining us in the next day so we're sitting there um, we'd overnighted and early the next morning we were getting ready to go and we thought it was maybe time to move maybe to a better place and we hear an aircraft we well, can't pinpoint the aircraft but it sounds like it's flying very high and it was it was an Antonov uh, one of the cargo planes the Russian cargo plane and was flying um towards Movingo uh, and further down south uh, was high up uh, so it was flying from a in a south southwesterly direction from the north northwest and was very high up 
let it go. We thought, okay, that's quite good. Now, I haven't touched on the armaments that we brought with us to take down the aircraft. We were trained on the SAM-7 surface-to-air missile. There's some photographs in uh, the material I've supplied. And we had undergone extensive training. In fact, Franz von Dijk, who then took over from Chris Fervey on the team on the other side, because Chris has sustained an injury, had gone for more training than all of us. And he'd come back and he had trained us on that. So he'd gone to Special Forces HQ in Pretoria um, and had undergone the training. Obviously, they had the captured documents. They had some Russian training manuals and things like that. And I think they even had somebody who knew how to use it. And the SAM-7 comes in a big box. Um, I'd say it's about two meters long, uh, mostly about 60 centimeters high and wide. And inside the SAM, inside the box is the missile itself. There is a firing mechanism which is separate. It looks a bit like half the butt of an LMG uh, with a trigger mechanism on it. It locks in underneath on the SAM-7 um, and it's got got to have batteries because the SAM-7 is mechanism and firing mechanism works on batteries and also has a heat sensing eye and sensor in the front um, and it can only be fired once. Once you fired it, you throw away uh, the rest of the, the tube that it comes in and the main missile is gone. They are not light. They are heavy to carry. So the guys who are walking in, I feel very sorry for them because they had to carry this thing, which is nearly two meters long and it's expensive. It costs a few million rand in pounds i think it's still a few million pounds as well um so they were carrying them in we had them stored on our saber unimogs which was really quite nice and we just looked after them made sure they didn't rattle around and so on so when we heard the antenna flying over we thought mm, it'd be nice to take a shot at it, but it was it was out of range it was too high it wasn't an ideal thing to be able to do um, you have a certain arc of fire that you can fire in. It has to be open in front of you. There are a few do's and don'ts you've got to do with this thing, but you've got to make sure you've got enough clearance in front of you because when you fire the missile, it takes off, but it doesn't immediately fly straight up. It tends to take a bit of an arc. It dives a bit, and then once the accelerant takes place, it then starts taking off and, and going up. We didn't know, but the day before uh, this particular morning, or two days before, Franz van Dijk and his team had shot down an Antonov 24 on their side of the river. Um, and there were some wreckage picks, which, I, which are in the material I've supplied, which you can have a look at. So they had come, they joined up with some of the UNITA guys which were there. And um, they had come across where the, um, the crashed Antonov was. I don't think there were any survivors in this particular one, uh, in particular crash. Uh, but we didn't know about this. We didn't, didn't hear it. We didn't see anything. We're oblivious to all of this. So the Antonov had flown over early that morning. And um, we waited a while. We thought, mm, you know what? Maybe it's going to come back. Lo and behold, in about 45 minutes' time, we could hear the plane and it was flying from behind us, going in a north northwesterly direction. And we thought, aha, come to daddy. So we got the. Um, Sam 7 out. Um, Tommy Thomas, who's on our team, was selected to fire it. We found we were on the riverine bank where there were a lot of trees and so on, but you had an open area. We line of sight uh, of the plane was um, we planned this, and the plane flew over us, over us. And once it was ready, sat we was ready with the thing, you press it. Um, it's got a gyroscope in it, you can hear the motor running, and he fired this thing and it took out, took off out of the tube. I thought it was going to crash in the river because the, the slope in front of us on the riverbank goes down quite far. There are a lot of reeds and things like it. Quite an open area uh, before you get the river. And then I thought it's gone. And next thing, the propellant took uh, took off and the thing just started going up. And we just watched this white trail as it followed the plane up like that. And sound is delayed and everything seems to happen in slow motion. And the plane was flying. It's a twin engine, uh, medium-sized cargo plane. And it hit the right engine of the plane. Came right underneath it uh, and hit the engine. Immediately, there was a trail of smoke and the plane started to bank to the port, port side. Spiraled down a bit like we watched it as it came down. Flying on one engine, obviously, it was not capable of doing that. I think that the damage caused by the exploding um, armament in the SAM-7 head did more damage to the plane as well. Um, 
I wouldn't know, but I would assume that that was the likelihood, uh, hence the reason for it coming down. And we watched it do a big circle like this. And then it came in from the western side, going in an easterly direction. I wouldn't say approaching us, more towards our left. And it was coming down hard. And there was a big open area on the ground, on the river bank, on the left-hand side, on the far side, we could see. And it tried to land there, but it um, it obviously couldn't control it couldn't control its speed and velocity. Um carried forward and then it crashed over into the into the river on the side of the river bank and and that's where it came to a standstill. Wow. Now of course we we so excited that this happened and we're sitting there and within about we could see people get, trying to get out of the plane and so on on the port side. But the, the right on the starboard side is where the damage was and but that was where the bank was they need to get out there. And we knew that there were crocs in the river because we'd uh, people had been in that area before. Uh, so we thought we'd, the last thing you want to do is jump out into the running water on the port side because you, you're going into running water. It's deeper there. And you know, it's crocodile's home, not yours. Then we heard fire, as in people opening fire. And there was an attack on the plane. And we didn't know who it was or what it was. So we then thought, okay, it must be UNITA. And there was a bit of a firefight, and it didn't last very long, maybe a minute and a half at most, quietened down, and we could see there was movement, but it was too far away from us. It must probably was a good um, six to 800 meters from us. So you could see the people there, but it just was too unclear. We didn't know anything. So we um, we were ecstatic about this. We thought, okay, well, UNITA's in the area. They know what's going on. Uh, MPLA wouldn't be fight firing on their own aircraft and so on, so... Um, we had to report back to our base. So we reported back to Hannes Fenter, who said we shot down one Antonov 24. And he said, well done, congratulations type of story. So we're still busy doing this. Next thing we hear on our radio, on our VHF radio, we hear Spanish being spoken. And we hear Spanish, but we can't identify who's speaking Spanish. At the same time, we heard um, the engine of a small plane. It was a very small aircraft, obviously, from the Angolan Air Force. Um, it was flying very high. Same route, northwest to south, southeast. Um, and it was following the route that the aircraft was going, the Antonov we shot down was going on. It was in the opposite direction. It was flying down. They were speaking Spanish. Um, we, the thought crossed our minds. All of us, oh, maybe you can shoot down in a small aircraft like that. But, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like trying to, uh, shoot a rabbit with a bazooka it's just you know the wrong thing and obviously the um, Sam 7 costs a lot of money so we waited a while and then the next thing we heard more talk and chatter but it wasn't the, the pilot in the small aircraft somebody else was speaking Spanish and then it sounded like French as well and we thought other aircraft in the area so of course we all ready um on standby and then we start hearing the sound of rotors of a helicopter two mi8 helicopters were now coming to look for the downed antonov 24 and they were flying up on the quito river where we were we're coming from a south southwesterly direction all along the river so we were ready we thought well, we're going to do whatever we need to do and uh, so we had the browning ready we had the 23 mil ready and we had our rifles ready now, we slide, on slight raised embankment like this, we'd moved out from under the trees from where we were before because now we want to have clear sight of what we're going to be attacking and targeting. And within two or three minutes, the helicopters were close by. They were coming from our left, going past us up there. And when I say they came past, they were 30, 40 meters away from us at our height, flying that height above the river. And we opened up with everything that we had on them on both helicopters you could see the pilots you could see the guys in the in the, the the one had doors closed as i recall the other one had open doors and we just fired at them as they came past us they were not expecting us to be there um the one veered immediately off to the left to the port side the other one started smoking very very badly been hit obviously engine and i don't know what other damage it did a big dog leg anti-clockwise came and sort of i wouldn't say crash landed but landed very hard on an island dry area in the middle of the river and people jumped out and smoke came out and they jumped out and they ran all over the place and so on and the helicopter was just sitting there and the, the rotor blades started were just spinning but spinning very slowly you could see nothing else had happened 
And uh, so, of course, we're quite excited, keeping our eyes open to see if there's anything else happening. The other helicopter was then obviously briefed and tasked to go and pick up the crew from this one that had been shot down and went, flew around to come and land where um, the where crews, the other crew of the other hel helicopter landed. And we thought, now's the opportunity. So we took out the 81 millimeter mortar, set it up. We're now ready to fire because it's too far to shoot with anything else that we had. So the distance was most probably three, 400 meters, maybe a bit more. But we also over a flood plain, over water, it's very difficult to judge the distance because you don't have trees or things like that. It's very difficult to judge. So we fired the first shot and it fell very short, actually about 200 meters short. Up the charges, up the charges, up the angle, fired. And the helicopter was about to take off. And just before it was about to take off, our last mortar fire, mortar round landed right underneath the helicopter. And the helicopter just started smoking, crash landed like that, and that was at the end of it. So we took down two helicopters and the Antonov. So now we go back to Honest Fenta. So we said, oh. one Antonov, two mi eight. <laughs> then we could hear him getting angry with us. He said, but you told us one Antonov. Now he's saying two mi eights. Make up your mind, what is it? So we said, no, one Antonov and now two mi eights. So obviously they were thrilled. We were achieving what we'd been set out. We'd set out to do. So we lay there for uh, the, in uh, in an all round defensive position for the rest of the day. During the course of that day, the small team guys had contacted us and said they were in the nearby vicinity. They would uh, be approaching us so that we didn't shoot at them or anything like that. And it wasn't until late that afternoon until they joined us. And there were uh, four of them in the team. And they came to join us, and they, what we had to do, we, we had to take them with us. But with the change of events with the helicopters, the two helicopters and Antonov being shot down, they were tasked to cross over the river to the other side. So late on that evening, um, Tommy Thomas and I were then, no, it wasn't Tommy, it was one of the other guys. Uh, Nick Pretorius and I were tasked to go and escort uh, the small team down to the river's edge and help them get across to the other side. Now, this part of the river was fairly wide. I would say it's 100 to 150 meters wide, fairly fast flowing. We know there are crocs there. We know on the on the island that they were going to, there were two helicopters which shut down previously in the afternoon. And on the embankment on the other side of, of the um, island was where the Antonov was lying. So the guys got their kit ready so that they, they stripped down to um, minimum the underwear took their kit and they put a ground sheet over it and they you fill it with stuff as much as you can so it's floatable but we had to help these guys go across so we took we had a lot of paracord with us so we tied the paracord um, onto long longer pieces so at least we could help them get across the other side if the kit gets lost we could always reel in the the equipment and so on but they would take the kit and they'd swim with it but we'd uh, attach it to them so the first the first guy that went across was ben Vensel. Now, Ben had previously been shot in an operation, had problems with his shoulder, and he wasn't swimming very well. But he said he wanted to go first, but he would swim out and let the stream take him uh, down. But at least he had enough power with him to get across to the other side. So Ben made it uh, he, first. He, he took off and he swam across the other side. The next guy was Mac McCabe. So Mac is short, wiry guy, tough as nails. And he was going to go next. So he took off and started swimming, towing his his uh, kit and his floating tarpaulin behind him. And we rig we running out the par paracord line. But the knots in the paracord line eventually uh, became too much. And we didn't want to hold him back, so we let go. So he was just swimming with his whole knot of par paracord behind him as he's swimming. As he's swimming like this, I see this croc come out from above like it. Not a baby croc. I would say four to five meters at least. Now it's nighttime, it's dark, there's a bit of moonlight up. We'd ride down on the water's edge in the reeds as we're watching the guys swimming across. And I'm saying to Mac, crocodile, crocodile, but he's swimming, he's swimming, and the water's rushing. Mac is not going to hear anything. I thought, what am I going to do here? You know, I don't want to fire any shots. We didn't know who was on the other side still at this stage. We thought it was Unita, but we weren't too sure. Um, so I said to Nick, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to take a pot shot at the croc. Now Nick was junior to me, and he said, yeah, but your chance of hitting Mac is very good because at this stage, we're looking at Mac and the crocodile's going for him and sort of straight line of sight because they're both being drifted by the river. 
by the river current. So um, I'm I'm an okay shot. I'm, I wouldn't say that I was a marksman. I, you know, I got my proficiency badge. And I can do those things um, well enough, um, but it counts under fire, which is the most important thing, whatever that's worth. So I'm sitting here and I'm now scared. What happens if I miss the crocodile and I hit Mac? You also, thoughts go through your head like that bullet could ricochet. If you're using the 556, five, could ricochet, could hit Mac as well. And I'm more worried about him, but this croc is getting closer and closer. Mac is a fairly good swimmer, but the croc is just a lot more faster. And this croc is moving. And eventually the croc is sort of fairly close to him. And when I say close, from what I could deduce, maybe about, about 10 meters or so behind him. And um, I thought it's now or never. And just then the croc went a bit to the left before it would, I, I think it would be the last closing approach before it came in on Mac. And I squeezed off, squeezed off a shot, and I hit the croc in the back of the head head over here. Well, that croc just started doing a butterfly thing up in the water. Oh, Mac got out of that water, and he walked on water to he was close he was close to the reeds, and he disappeared into the reeds, and he was gone. <laughs> I mean, that was it was yes, it was calculated, but it was a lucky shot as well. Jeez. And Mac, Mac went. His kit also went. Now in his in his kit, he had cameras, recording devices. Various other pieces of equipment that they'd used in observation posters. He lost a few hundred thousand rands worth of equipment lying somewhere at the bottom of the Quita River today. Um, that was it. So he couldn't continue at this stage. Um, now you've got a guy who's only in his underpants and he's sitting on an island. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's got Ben with him as well. And Ben is still sustained, uh, still struggling with the injury he sustained previously. Still capable, but not as strong as he could be. Anyway, there's not much we could do. We move back to our temporary base. I go and report him to uh, Flip Marks, and I told him what had happened. He said, no, he heard the shot. He didn't know what it was. He said, why not more shots? I said, because I only had one shot. That's the only shot that I could get. So he thought, okay, that's fine. So we're in all-round defense position. About three o'clock in the morning, I'm standing there and there's water dripping on me. And I look up and here's Mac standing over me, just in his underwear, still dripping water. They swam back because they couldn't, couldn't continue with their operation in the meantime. All his equipment gone, rifle gone. What's he going to do? Um, so they then joined us. Um, we gave them some of our clothing that we had. So I remember Mac was walking around under, un, underwear, his, his underpants. A long sleeve shirt and boots. That's how he was for the next few days in the in the vehicle as as an operational uh, special forces soldier. <laughs> anyway, so we took them with us for the next few days um, until uh, they could be collected, and uh, we RV'd um, at a place, and then they were collected by helicopter and they were taken out. We then had to make our way back to um, our operational base to Fort Foot, and uh, so we had to drive back, but with Having stood up the hornet's nest, we anticipated that we might uh, come across um, the enemy in various forms. Whether it be aircraft, we were more worried about aircraft than anything else. But I think us taking down the helicopters and the Antonov, they were a bit scared. Um, they didn't want to come into our area. And um, at this stage, then we also had discovered who was on the other side of the river. That was the team there. They had also then done their damage and they exfiltrated so the two ops were the same op but they're just two different components of it so i can't really talk about theirs that much the photographs you'll see of photographs that they took so you can see the sam 7 being fired and you see the guys getting it ready and it's really great we didn't have the gamma shots with us as well we would we weren't the gamma boys for this op um flip marks also had to be who was our team commander had to be evacuated he sustained an injury um uh, not too long before in a vehicle that had rolled and he had back problems and this constant buffeting and bouncing up and down the vehicle had made it too difficult for him. And uh, so we had uh, another young officer that had been flown in just to help us um, on our exfiltration route. So we had uh, someone in command of the operation so we could exfiltrate. And then we exfiltrated and went back to Fort Foot and that was Ops Agony. Wow. What I do need to mention, what I do need to mention, some of the things that happen when you're out there. Stupid things. And people don't think about that. Remember, I talked in the one video about guys being stung by bees. Yeah. One of the guys who served with me a lot, and there's some photographs of him and I, is Via Furi, the Skark Villain. We were of the same age, same rank, and he was commander of one of the vehicles with us. Whilst we were there, um, 
now it's already sort of October, November. It's it's hot. It hasn't rained yet. Um, there's a fly out there which is a cross between a bumblebee and a tsetse fly. It's called a goliath. It looks like a bumblebee, but it's got a very big proboscis. And then I've seen them on horses. On our horse farm when I grew up, we had them on our horses and on the cattle. And they would normally land on the underside of the belly, and they put this proboscis in, and they watched their body turn red as they sucked up the blood. And once they'd left, the blood often wouldn't congeal on the animal from which they'd sucked. But the proboscis is long. It's nearly about a centimeter long. They took a fancy to Ezria for whatever reason. I mean, we were a bit like tsetse flies and occasionally one would bug us. But he was stung by these things on a regular basis to such a stage, to such a, at such a stage, we actually had to get a warm winter insulated jacket to put over him. Now, temperatures are 35, 40 degrees. But they couldn't bite through this thing. So he was either sweated out or get bitten out. Uh, I, I was also the group medic. So I had to uh, give him antizan and stuff or pain for this thing but they would still they would sting him and it would come up like a boil um on the skin like it so, so things like that you don't anticipate one of the guys who was in my vehicle he was the driver a guy called johan Stradom or strace which means us uh, means ostrich in afrikaans because he's so tall um he was checking the vehicle in the morning before we took off on our daily trip so we do a thing called first parade. For first parade, you check everything. You do walk around the vehicle. You check the tires. You check the chassis. You check anything that moves and operates. You even check the battery. And you check the engine, engine oil, any leaks, anything like that. And you do that every day to make sure that your vehicle is in good running condition, which helps. And he came to the battery, and he couldn't see into the battery to see how how much fluid and acid was in there. And he had one of those little gooseneck torches with the gooseneck you put it on, put it in there, but it was on his kit at the back. No, see, what he did, he hauled out a cigarette lighter and he lit it as he put it there. And what happens if you do that near a, near a battery? The fumes in that thing ignited like a blowtorch and blew into his face. Oh, man. And scor scorched the cornea of his eyes and he couldn't see both of his eyes. He was in absolute agony. So we had to strap him up. I had to put um, eye drops on um, I had some Vaseline, luckily, and I put some Vaseline in there, just covered his eyes up, gave him something for pain, and we had to strap him up and keep him like that for a few days. We got a resupply of food, and we thought that we were going to actually come and pick him up, but the guys dropped off something for us at nighttime uh, by cargo chute, uh, new uniforms and clothing and some ammunition. So we said to them, what do you do with the old uniforms? They said, burn them. We'd been in this in these uniforms for so long now. They were this this camouflage pattern that uh, you will see on the picture. By the time we'd been operating, for the duration we'd been operating, your body oils and the dirt and everything, it looked like a, a brown putty color. You couldn't see the camouflage anymore. We stank to high heaven. I remember when we got the new clothes, I said it's about time for bath as well. So that particular day, there was a storm which came over. So I remember going out slathering myself down with soap and getting ready and so on and I just put it all on my hair ready to wash my hair as well with the soap it stopped raining so for the next few days I walked around with hair which was like this and <laughs> I can't use your water bottle to do it until we got to the stream and I could wash it off <laughs> yeah sort of one of those things I brought back some of that clothing I thought ah, I'm going to keep some of the uniform for memento purposes I put it in the washing machine and when it came out it was in threads it just broke the oh, the, 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 it was too damaged yeah, yeah. anyway Oops, so this is the forerunner of another very successful operation that took place in 1981 called Kaslich, which in Afrikaans, um, if translated, means candlelight. Um, as I mentioned earlier on in my introduction, to be able to stop the supply of equipment and goods which comes in by harbor, one of the places, one of the things to do is to attack the harbor. So this is what we then plan to do. Um, in conjunction with 4 Ricky, which is our sea the Seaborne Sister Regiment, which is based in Longaban in the in the Cape, which is north of Cape Town, about 160 k's uh, kilometers north of Cape Town, I think. Um, we obviously had to prepare and train for this as well. So our whole Bravo Group team were flown down to Longaban. The base hadn't been fully built at this stage. Um, it was the early stages of being built, that was the last of the regiments to be uh, to be relocated and to be based uh, elsewhere. 
um, out of Durban, where everybody had initially started as reconnaissance commando. So we'd all been flown down um, to the Air Force Base nearby, been shipped over by trucks to Longaban. And we had some places that we could stay in. There were some storerooms. Um, there weren't any barracks ready. There was an old hotel. It was a bit of a flea pit and so on. But some of the guys stayed in the hotel. And obviously, the Defense Force covered these costs. But we were there to prepare and train for our next operation, which was, I think, Amazon at that stage. Um, all of us had been seaborne trained. When I say seaborne, we could work with kayaks and with Zodiacs um, and with the submarines and so on. We weren't the seaborne regiment like the other guys who were attack divers and um, had various other dive qualifications. But you don't need that for many of your operations that you're going to participate in. One Ricky was primarily urban and bush warfare. So we had to uh, specialize in both areas. And four Ricky was seaborne operations. Um, and they obviously they could go on shore and do their bush uh, warfare and things like that. And urban to some degree, but that was not as I understand it, their strength in terms of capabilities. Theirs was seaborne and anything to do with the sea and to do with water. So they even undertook uh, some operations where they blew up bridges in rivers, where there were crocodiles and so on. Um, there are a lot of those operations which took place. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about this. I'm going to talk about oper Operation Amazon. We trained and done a lot of preparation in Longabon. Um, and then, like they always say, raincoats on, raincoats off. So this was a time for the raincoats to stay on and the operation was not going to carry on. We didn't know what we were going to do, but we did an awful amount of rowing. Uh, we went in Zodiacs and we were in kayaks. We went up rivers at night and we came down rivers at night. We got ensnared in fishermen's nets, <laughs> much to the disdain of Hannes Fenter because he was a perfectionist and professional soldier in every way. Hey, we sort of laughed it off. It wasn't a laughing matter for him. He said, I imagine that if that was the enemy, you know, we were young, we were reckless. But if you have somebody like that who makes you do it all over again because you stuff up the previous night, you learn that lesson very quickly. So we we did this. We went out into the sea in the Zodiacs in, in heavy water, uh, heavy water, uh, heavy weather. I remember getting pneumonia. I was quite sick. Um, I wasn't. I was only given two days to recuperate and then to come back to continue with the training, even though I wasn't feeling that great. Anyway, so this was the first part, and then uh, the raincoat stayed on, and nothing happened. A few months later, we get told it's on again. We don't know what, but it's on again. <laughs> we then get briefed in Durban uh, by intelligence and the very senior officers that we're going to do an attack on Lobito Harbour. Um, and we had to get ourselves ready for the operation. We flew down to Longabon and um, everything that we would require for the operation equipment wise and so on would be there. We would be working in collaboration with Four Ricky, who would be our taxi drivers. Hey guys, I'm only joking. Now, we always used to joke with the guys from Four Ricky to say they glam they 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 glamour they glamorous uh, taxi drivers. They weren't, but they were better handling the boats and the zodiacs, and we were. It was their area of expertise, not ours. We'd rather work with them. They had taken guys up the coast to go and do um, reconnaissance. Uh, the small team group that I referred to early on from Wanreki under the uh, guidance of uh, Jack Kreef, who was Staff Sergeant then, had actually gone up into the Lubito Harbor area, had done reconnaissance. We had information that we got from locals um, and from other information we could glean. So we had enough information to know that there were oil storage and uh, fuel storage tanks um, in Lubito Harbor. So the fuel, um, the fuel or the oil would be offloaded. There was also a PPC cement factory nearby. And obviously what we want to do is the most damage that we can. Um, if we could, we would have taken out uh, some of the ships as well. Uh, but that happened in Operation Kasluch, not in this particular operation. So as mentioned, Lubito really was um, a vital point um, from a support um, infrastructural system for the whole of Angola, but also for the MPLA armed forces and the war that they were uh, involved in with UNITA and um, with South Africa. So our brief was to go in to cause as much damage again. It's like kids in the, like kids in the in the sandpit. Go in and do as much damage as you can to 
to really interrupt and and um, undermine the capabilities of the enemy um and it should be to destroy any fuel storage depots anything else would be of use to them um the cement factory the Port, uh, pretoria portland cement factory ppc um was also on the radar and obviously if we could do ships or anything else like that that would be nice but this wasn't part of the brief you'll see from the photographs that lubito harbor which is the southernmost harbor in angola has a long spit uh, running in line with the coastline, which separates the harbor uh, from the sea. And um, we were briefed to then approach Lubito. We would go up by ship. And then from from out at sea, international waters, we would then, under cover of darkness, uh, go into Lubito Harbor and do what needed to be done. There were quite a large number of us, obviously supported by four wrecking, and we departed from Longabon on strike craft. Now, the South African Navy had a number of strike craft which had been bought from the Israelis. Strike craft is a wonderful uh, medium-sized uh, tactical ship. Um, has cannons on it, has rockets, has a number of things that you, or missiles, not rockets, I, I sound like a pleb over here, um, to be able to do enough damage. Um, but it's not a destroyer, it's not a battleship, it's nothing big like that. It's a small to medium-sized um, ship capable of doing the necessary. And I think in terms of the old dispensation in South Africa, it what worked in terms of uh, being able to support the rest of the Navy up and down the the uh, coastal waters of South Africa. Yeah, but I, saw them, I saw them in Durban Harbour. They were about 70 foot long, something like that. Yeah, I think a bit longer than 70 foot, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, they had big cannon at the back on a rot rotary dial and then on the side and then the um, missile pods and so on. Um, and there were enough of them. So for the duration for this operation, we were going to go up um, the West Coast. Um, we would have all the operators from Wanariki that were going to be involved in the operation on the strike craft. I think there might have been a second one. I stand corrected. My memory doesn't uh, serve me too well at the moment. Um, and we would go up in international waters and then go inland uh, from there. The strike craft coming from Israel was built for flatter, calmer water, the Mediterranean. The Atlantic and the West Coast waters of Africa is not the Mediterranean. And that ship is narrow. It rolls and it rocks. And yours truly gets seasick, whether he wants to at all or not. So the trip there is four four days trip. Yeah. So we came out of Longabon and we went north. We weren't sleeping in the comfy quarters where the rest of the crew sleeps. No, we had the gun bay at the back. And the gun bay is wonderful because it's just steel floor and the wonderful smell of diesel because the diesel fuels fumes come in there. And you got this lubricated grease and stuff that they use inside the gun bay. And the gun bay is like an indoor squash court underneath where this thing is housed. And it's most probably 20 to 30 meters, maybe in, in diameter on the inside, maybe a bit narrower than that. But that's where you're sitting and you've got this the big railing on which the stuff revolves on the ground and the mechanism at the top. Um, it's fairly open. When I say open, you've got big vents at the top and so on to allow air to pass through. It's got a recoil system in there. So when these when the guns do fire, it's able to recoil into the gun bay itself and the breeze normally. So all the salty sea water, especially if it's raining and so on, does come through the hatches and so on. And this is where we were with our kit. And it's like, I suppose, being in a vehicle when you're driving, because I tend to get, I, I suffer from ocean sickness. So even parachuting, I jumped out of planes just before I vomited because I get air sick as well. That's free fall and static line. In a car, I get car sick. I can't read a map in a car, but I think it's that thing of when you're not looking out and looking, you you get car sick. And I'm not just being on a ship, sail, yachts and so on. As soon as I'm out and I'm looking above, irrespective of the fact that it's doing this, I get car, I get seasick. Not as bad perhaps as others. And after about the third day, I find my legs. But uh, depending on how rough the water is and like we were in the strike craft, we were encapsulated inside the steel dome. And boy, did I feel dreadful. Guys on the other ship, I know, were also going through exactly the same. So you're going through a rough sea, so you're doing this, and the ship is rolling in this. Uh, this is wonderful. It's just anything you eat 
just comes up like that. It took me, I'd say, about 10 to 15 years to be able to eat this uh, UHT packaged custard like uh, Danone and Dairy Bell and all of these make because that is one of the things that they served on the Strikecraft. I, I'd have it, and within two minutes, I'd upchuck. Um, you go up to the galley, and for the people who don't know what a, a ship's a kitchen is, yeah, yeah, you go up to the galley, and we never went to sit inside because they didn't want us to meet with the crew of the strike craft. We go up on the outside. It's not very big. It's most probably four meters by four meters, if that, to serve the whole crew. And they slide the window open, and they give you your tray, and they put your things on there. And I remember, I, I remember the, the fried egg floating on the oil on the top of this thing like this. And I don't do runny egg at all. I, I can't do that. But you get what you get. And runny egg on this oil now, which has gone cold and whatever else, um, it doesn't work too well. And I just couldn't keep anything down. By the time we got to um, our destination, all I've been able to manage is to keep down some water. None of the food just stayed in me. Oh, a few cups of coffee. I made friends with one of the engineers on board this truck craft. And he's, I told him that I was struggling. He said, I'm going to give you something to fix you up. But they say in Afrikaans, Rechmaker, something to a fixer upper. <clears throat> so I went down with him into the bottom, into the engine. And he had some coffee uh, that he was brewing down there. So he was chief engineer and he said, have some of this. Well, I think you could have stripped the paint of a wall with anything else just by painting that stuff on. It was thick and syrupy, and that's not including any sugar. And I had about three cups of that on my trip going up there. That's about the only thing I kept down. It was so bitter and so strong, I suppose. It just sort of fixed me up. Anyway, we got to within uh, strike distance of Lubito Harbor at night. Um, later on in the afternoon, we prepared because part of getting off the strike craft is also cam is setting up the Zodiacs because we're going in on Zodiacs. Um, can bring down the net on the side um into the zodiac and then um going from there because when the water is very rough and you have this type of thing and you're trying to get in we trained for this and so on but the water was particularly rough but we were fine you know we we'd rehearsed enough and we got into the zodiacs and i think there were four four or five zodiacs um and each of them had about six to eight guys on board uh dressed in our greenies covered in black as well black is beautiful AKs and all the other equipment we needed, plus limpet mines. So um, a certain company that I'd mentioned before had been responsible for developing these limpet mines for us. So they had a key mechanism. So they would, with a magnet, they would stick onto the side of a tank or anything like that, which we would, um, which we would uh, be targeting. So EMLC had made these things for us. And we had a number of these things that we were going to um put onto the tanks that we're going to target. So these were oil tanks and fuel storage tanks. Um, so if ever you've driven past any of those storage facilities, these, these massive round tanks, this big depot, and there are lots of them. And um, so under the cover of darkness, we left the strike craft um, going in, and you, you can see the Beto Harbor. It's just these lights. It's dark, and you can see all of these lights. There. But take into account, it's a, it's a shipping uh, town, because of all the ships that are there, and there are a lot of people that stay there. What do most people do with the stay on the coast? They fish. And so there are a lot of little shipping, little fishing boats out there with their nets and so on like that. You've got to be so careful with this. And this is why we'd been training in the Longobarn area, coming down the river estuary, where the guys are fishing nets and so on. So, you know, your training pans out along the line. So now you're going very quietly and slowly because you don't want to you don't want to be observed by any of these things. And we snuck past all of these little fishing boats and trawlers into the into the harbor. You know, it's funny when you come into the harbor area, now you're coming past the sands, but you've got a solid piece on your left-hand side, the northern side, and on the southern side, there's a there's a light, uh, a bright light shining on that area of the spit and also into the water. You think that you're standing out like a sore thumb, like I'm standing here. This is what you feel like. But the boat is black. Everything else is black. There's nothing that shines. And people are not thinking, oh, the bunch of guys going to come in and come and do something like this. Um, and if my, memory, if my memory serves me correctly, it was a Saturday night or a Sunday night. Best time to do it. People are out chilling or having parties, going to do their things, visiting their friends, going for a barbecue, something to eat and to drink. Um, 
And here, guys, we've got nothing better to do with their own time while coming in to do some stuff in the harbor. Anyway, so we stuck in the harbor. We turned uh, south, went down to our designated point. I remember that the bank was too high and we had to move around. We, the, some of the guys got up and couldn't get out. And the guys were stuck in in uh, sort of shallow, shallow draft water, got out and it was very marshy and muddy. So the guys had to get back in and we had to move around um, uh, about 200 meters further up which wasn't close to where we wanted to be, but it was fine then we could uh, debus. The other Zodiac, if I recall, with uh, guys on, uh, one of the Zodiacs went to where the PPC factory was, which was on the western side, on the land side of the of the harbor. They had to go and do their thing. We had to do our own thing. So we get off, uh, debus, the Zodiacs pull back, go back into the water because you can be seen there. There's water, there's light reflecting on them. But and if people were walking past, which they were, they could see something. So the area we're going into is fenced off and there were gates. There's a lot of that gravel on the ground around there, like they normally do in industrial areas. It didn't cover all of the ground, but most of the ground, and especially up near the tanks itself, it was a lot of gravel. But we were close to on our right hand side as we're facing south to our right. There were a number of buildings there. There was a pub or a bar and a restaurant. And there were some flats above. Um, and there were people walking up and down there. There were people sitting outside and drinking. I remember guys there having quite a few beers. They are Um, And then there was couples walking up and down and some of the enemy soldiers, some of the MPLA. You feel like they're going to see you any moment. But then you realize... You've got the advantage on your side. You've been training. You've been preparing for this. You are black. They're looking from the light into the dark. They're not necessarily going to see you. So you got all that advantage on your side. Um, and that's just the psychological component of it. And the people are close by. When I say close by, some of them were 30, 40 meters away from us at some stages. And they're sitting there. Now you're getting off and you're starting to walk on this gravel. And it sounds like people, when you take those schoolboy marbles and you rub them together and they make a lot of noise, that's what it sounds like. It, and you think everybody can hear you. And we're wearing these flat, tacky sole boots um or like runners runner boots like a saw actually more like the mountaineering boots that they use for climbing with a very smooth sole like that and they make very little noise when you when you walk on the gravel but they still make a noise we went up to where we had to go we had to get through the gates one of the gates was locked um we got our made our way through it my task um with one of the other guys was to stay at the gate uh to provide protection for the guys who are going to go in um and we were obviously on radio and we would then be communicating to them if there was any problem. So we're sitting here and we could watch the guards walking up and down there. None of them came in our direction. We were ready. If we had to, guys went into, into the, through the gates and went into the park, if you could call it park or the depot. And they put the limpet mines on a lot of the tanks like that. Um, on the photograph, I think there was something like eight or 10 that I recall in, in the immediate area. There were some others nearby. Um, Put the limpet mines on. These limpet mines are specially designed for the purpose, so they wouldn't just blow a hole, but they would also ignite. And that's what you want. You want to ignite the contents of the of the storage tank. I kept on thinking the guys are going to come back. <laughs> when I say the guys are going to come back, the, the guys who were patrolling. Saturday night, the guys get lazy. They're not going to do it. Who's going to come all the way from South Africa to come visit them in the little town of you know, Lobito? Anyway, the guys finished what they had to do. It took them about 45 minutes to an hour came back um we then went down to the water's edge zodiac had come in we got on board the zodiac we went out to lying low on the zodiac going slow we're not the the motors just chug chug chugging it's got a silence on as well so it doesn't make the noise of a normal outboard motor we're going past there were ships moored on the side going past them the guys on the ships up there they could look down they could see us but you expect any moment somebody's going to say something not going to happen chug out of the harbor once we get out, we turned a little bit more south, so we didn't go into the, the fishing boats and all the fishermen that were out there. We went out, and once we were sort of beyond where they were, we thought, oh, this is great. We, the Zodiacs opened up with a bit of speed, and I remember two things at that stage. As we were doing that, a whole school of Cape Dusky dolphins came out next to us, and the Zodiac is no match for them in their speed, and they were oh. jumping like this and Beautiful. breaching the water next to us on all sides as we were going out, and the Zodiacs are going. Beautiful. We must have been out of the harbor for about 10 minutes when that sky lit up. And when I say lit up, it was just, it was like the sun coming up. It's just unbelievable. Um, so we, we did a fair amount of damage. We, we destroyed um, all the 
all the storage tanks over there. The PPC factory was damaged. There was a lot more secondary damage was done to the buildings and everywhere around there. Lubito is a pretty little town. If you look at it today, it's a nice little coastal town and so on. But that damage there that had been incurred was massive. Obviously, beyond that, all the fuel that is needed to be able to supply uh, what's going, uh, what um, MPLA and the Angolan government needed to carry on with the war and just operating in that area was was enormous. Anyway, we made our way back to the strike craft and um, we got on our respective the strike craft. Obviously, there was a lot of celebration. You'll see some of the photographs that were there. You'll see I'm wearing glasses in the one photograph I because I wear contact lenses. My eyes were so gritty and so tired and from the black is beautiful gets your eyes. My eyes look like arc welders. I took my lenses out. So I'm wearing glasses. They still got black is beautiful on. But the guys had brought along, we weren't supposed to, but they brought along the bottles of champagne. So we had quite a bit of a party over there. Um, yeah. Need, needless to say, it wasn't too long and half an hour after that, well, I, I upchucked all that champagne. It just came straight up again because we hit the rough water going back. The water was so rough and the sea was so rough going back that there were um, crew on board the ship right in the in the front in the bow of the ship um, that got knocked back one guy ended up with a broken collarbone ribs and something else the other guy gashed on his head and concussion because of the waves we were hitting coming back it was really rough sea um, we got back to Longaban four days later and I remember one of the um, one of my colleagues on the other ship a tall guy by the name of Voter Basson or Baz as we called him and I looked at him and he looked at me and we both were gaunt so we went back. We said, we, we, we're feeling really grim. So they gave us something to help us. Um, I think it was a Lomital or something like that to help us with our nausea because your seasickness doesn't leave you immediately when you're going to land. It's still, it's like flu. And there was a scale there, and I got into scale, and I'd lost 20 pounds just on that trip alone. Yeah. So because it was a pound scale, but 20 pounds. So you work that out. That's, so that's yeah. what, about eight, eight, nine kilograms? Yeah, eight, nine kilograms. Good. We couldn't go home. So I'm going to explain why we couldn't go home. The newspapers were full of this big attack on the harbor in Lobito and the Sunday Times and all the newspapers. And of course, the the South African Defense Force and the government denied all of this. So we had to lie low because the paparazzi and the press were hanging outside, around outside the base at one Ricky. And four Ricky wasn't really established yet, but there were people around. So there's a bit of an, I wouldn't call it an island, but it's a place just north of uh on this there's a barn here longer barn uh, a sandbar which goes out an island and and there's some buildings over there so that we had to stay there and away from the press for about a week just to lie low until everything had died down so it was quite nice we felt like i was on the greek islands and we were eating um crayfish and things like the dugout that, that got for us out of the water until everything had sort of quietened down. And then we flew back to Durban. And of course, when we got back to Durban, all the people that we knew that were there, civilian and in military, said, oh, we knew where you were. But of course, you deny all plausibility and accountability for that. It was a good operation. And obviously, the second operation that then took place was Kaslich, which was in 1981 that I was not involved in uh, due to other personal commitments. Um. But lessons learned on this, that you can get in under the enemy's nose. You can surprise them. And we had the capability. We were good at what we did. And I'm not thumping my chest and saying, oh, this or that. We were good at what we did. But, you know, it comes down to every individual. Um, it comes down to team effort. It comes to thorough planning. And I still believe today that if it wasn't for Hannes Fenter, who was in charge of the operations and in planning this, we wouldn't have done such great work. Um he enabled us to do great things, and I thank him today. And I also thank God that God was there to save me, even though I was a real <laughs> whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but today I have a bigger purpose, a bigger calling to serve. So thank you very much. Amen. Greg, I can't tell you what an incredibly good talk that was. Very inspiring, very lucid, very coherent, very descriptive. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was really transported into another world. And... Um, it just it just makes me realize the caliber of men that, that were available and the things that they did, which we know so little about. I mean, it must have been incredibly exciting going in that um, clipper craft, the Zephyr craft, whatever you call it, driving into Levito. Incredibly exciting. I mean, your your stomach must have been full of butterflies and literally just pressed on. A wonderful, wonderful story. Um, I'm a bit of a historian buff, and um, these raids on 
on the supply lines of enemy any enemy units and formations was absolutely vital. Um, and in fact, when Hannibal attacked the Romans, uh, they couldn't defeat him. But there was a, a Roman general called Fabius Maximus, and his strategy was to attack the supply lines of Hannibal. And mm -hmm. he, he messed them up to such a degree that the, the, the troops in the front line who were beating the Romans nonstop in, in open battle they eventually didn't have enough equipment and resupplies or fresh men. And uh, so it's vital, absolutely vital. And I think that's where the Allies uh, scored higher points than the Germans did in the Second World War. They were forever behind the, the lines, blowing things up and destroying things. And the Germans never seemed to do that. And um, as a result of that, they didn't have the same punch or ability to survive. Mm -hmm. So very, very good talk on that. I'm sure you've got hundreds of other stories. and. Um, um, it's so hard to get hold of a guy like you who can talk clearly, think clearly, um, bring detail forward that we're all interested in, that I'm sure we'll be calling you back to listen to some of your other operations. Um, you, you're well within the Rhodesian Fighting Men of Rhodesia Club now, so we're going to be putting our hooks in you. And um, But I just want to say thank you very, very much. And if there's anything you'd like to say in closing, please do. I do. I <laughs> Try to reach out to a few other men out there who served at the same time or other times um, with me. Um, a lot of them, for their own personal reasons, don't want to come um, onto a video or to be recorded for doing something like this. Some of them don't feel they have the confidence. Some of them don't feel it's something that they want to do. Some of them, in their private and their work capacity, feel that it might have a negative impact on them. Uh, and I do understand that. Um, I spoke to a few people earlier this week, and they said, thanks, but no thanks. They'd prefer not to do it. So on yeah. behalf of the guys who cannot speak, uh, I'm doing the best that I can. Yeah. Um, I'm not the type of person, give me a mic and I'll talk. There's a purpose for doing this. And a lot of it is so that this is not lost in the annals of time. Absolutely. We want to make sure that this is recorded and kept. There's a lot of writing about it, but some people don't like to read. As, mm -hmm. uh, some people are un incapable of reading, mm -hmm. um, and watching a video is a lot easier for them. Mm -hmm. Sure, the accuracy may leave a lot to be desired. As I saw with certain people made some comments on the various operations we talked about, um, like um, uh, Ops Snoopy and Ops Uric. But be that as it may, um, it's also my point of reference and my call and also what I recall at this stage. And I hope that uh, people who are listening to this have found, it, have found it and do find it entertaining. And it's not that we're thumping our chest. We're just telling a story. It's my personal perspective. And Tony, thank you to you and John for enabling this to happen so that other people can share in this. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. And I'd like to just appeal to all um, Rhodesian viewers, extradition soldiers, male and female, to please, please, please come forward and give us your story. It's not about chest thumping. I've said this before. It's not any, you know, we even want to talk to farmers, people who fought through the war in a civilian capacity. It's not about chest thumping or victories or being Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's just part of the tapestry of our history, which needs to be recorded because there's so much bias and, and bullshit out there, to put it bluntly. So, Greg, Thank you. Very I want much. to add something quickly. I want yeah. to add something quickly. You can edit this out. Um, in the feedback on one of the videos that we previously did, somebody who had been involved either in Zipro or Zunla came up, a guy by the name of Solomon, yes. and said he'd be interested to talk. And I think it would be vital to get somebody like him on to be able to talk, to give his opinion. Um, some years back, I bumped into a guy at a conference at Sun City and while we were talking, he leant over and he said, you sound like a Rhodesian. We were having breakfast in the morning. So I said, now I spent a bit of time up there. And we started talking. It turned out that in Ops Snoopy, he was on the other side, on Zanla. Wow, wow that's interesting. Not that we were to become brothers, but he said they thought they were winning. We thought we were winning. We both withdrew at the end of the operation, went about on our own things like that. But he said it was quite an eye-opener that... Um, I was willing to talk about it. And we didn't talk in great depth. We didn't, it wasn't the time or place to do it. But mm. the fact that we actually talked about it and we shared, I didn't hold any bitterness or any grudge against right. him. Likewise, I don't think he did either towards me. And for me, it was just sort of one of those moments that you 
say thank you. It was interesting. I mm -hmm. don't know how else to describe it. Um, not that as you share that with everybody, but just sort of one of those moments in time to think, hey, this was somebody who I could have met face to face. Mm -hmm. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't, but here we are today. Absolutely. Well, with your permission, I'd like to keep that last little bit in the video. It's it's pertinent. And uh, yeah, sure, if Solomon's listening into this one, we'd very much like to hear from you. Greg, uh, thank you very much. Um, I know that we're going to be hearing from you again because you, you did a lot of other ops. So until that time, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely. Bye, <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. God bless, Greg.